Good morning, everybody. Um, well, nearly everybody. <laughs> We're very quiet this morning, so I thought the best thing to do is to get started, because if anybody is going to come, they'll come when we start. <laughs> um, just to one or two, just to highlight, firstly, an apology. The reading that is the Old Testament reading that is printed in the service sheet is not the right one, and that is entirely my fault because I wrote, when I was preparing in the order of service, I wrote the wrong reference and Cathy printed it. <laughs> so, and I didn't notice. However, you will have the right reading read, which is the second half of Exodus chapter two and not the first half. Um, so when Lydia reads, it will be from there. On the notice sheet, just to highlight that the uh, lunchtime concerts begin this Thursday, so uh, do, do come and, if, if you like to come and join in that, please do. Um, the, uh, and then a reminder that the first two Sundays of July have been switched round, so that the 9th of July is the All Age Worship and will be a welcome for Jeff Adams as he prepares, as he, following his ordination. So do pray for him and the family as they prepare to come and begin this new phase of their lives and ministry. Uh, and Agnes has got some uh, little notes about this. She would like to give them to you, but could you, um, could you tell her if you're thinking of staying for that so that we can have a bit of a vaguer numbers for, for, um, for catering purposes? So please have a word with our Agnes. She's got some sheets about it, and that will be great. And... Just uh, to make sure that the, the start of our series of, uh, of, uh, on Moses was inauspicious and we've got the wrong reading, <laughs> we are actually starting a four-part series on the life of Moses and what it might mean to us in the next four weeks. And uh, we'll try and get back on track with printing the right reading next week. I have chosen, and the Tuesday group will know this, that uh, just for the introductory parts of our service, I've taken some quotes from Psalm 90, which is the only psalm attributed to Moses in the book of Psalms. And um, so uh, just using some bits uh, from that, because they reflect something of uh, Moses. You will, many of you will know Psalm 90 better in the form of in God our help of our ages past, of course. So let's, as we come together, um, Lord Jesus Christ, we pray you'll bless our worship together and pray that we see your kingdom grow amongst us. Amen. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. We stand to sing, Christ is made the sure foundation.
say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Do please be seated. And Psalm 90 verse 8 says, You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. As, the light, as God's light is shone on our lives, we become aware of our need of his forgiveness. And we come in assurance that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. And so may the God of love forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by his spirit and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. And the collect for the first Sunday in Trinity. O oh God, the strength of all those who put their trust in you, mercifully accept our prayers, and because through the weakness of our mortal nature we can do no good thing without you, grant us the help of your grace, that in keeping of your commandments we may please you both in will and deed. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Just before I hand over to John for worship, I think congratulations are due, I'm told, that uh, Fred and Anne, you've uh, celebrated 50 years, I gather, this week. Yes. <laughs> So congratulations to you, 50 years of marriage. Yes. Maybe you'll take Psalm 90, 12 and 14 away with you. <laughs> Teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. <laughs> congratulations anyway to you all. Thank you, Tony. Good morning, we're going to sing two songs uh, together, um, as we often do. Uh, the two songs, the first one is a new one. We did it uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, o Church Arise, and then I Will Offer Up My Life. Two wonderful songs of us uh, offering ourselves to God, uh, to his service. So I'd invite you to stand, if you're able, as we sing these songs.
seated for our first reading. Our first reading is taken from Exodus chapter 2, beginning at verse 11. Moses flees to Midian. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them hard at their hard labour. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Glancing this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day, he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from the Pharaoh and went to live in Midian where he sat down by a well. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to rule, their father, he, he asked them, why have you returned so early today? They answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where, he, where is he? He asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become an alien in a foreign land. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. This is the word of the Lord. Speak to God. And the gospel is taken from the gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 9, verses 10 to 13. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Please do be seated. So I'm hoping that Am I on? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm hoping that um, you remember that before Easter we looked at um, our Vision 22 um, vision. <laughs> and the four themes within that of growing, making Jesus known by growing in our sense of community, our sense of spirituality and worship, how we use this building. Um, for cultural purposes, for our arts and music, and um, finally, how we use this building for heritage. And as we've reflected on that, we want to keep on reminding ourselves of that and building on this 
as a church. So it's not something that we're going to do once and then forget about, but you're going to hear us talking about it a lot as we work out what that really is going to mean for us as a church. And um, we're going to be looking at Moses for a few weeks, but before we do that, I just want to just sort of reflect on that because I think it's really important that we grasp that we all, to make this come, this reality, to make Vision 22 a reality, we all have a part to play. And I was reminded at Deanery Synod this week um, of 1 Corinthians 12 and, and Paul talking about us all being part of the body. And... Um, for, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. Um, and it says, because I am not, if the foot would say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. In other words, we all have a part to play in the body. And we can't say to each other, well, we have no need of you. Or we can't say to ourselves, they have no need of me. We all have our own part to play in the body of Christ. We're consciously in, or, or we're consciously in it, or if we're not, we're consciously out of it. So to how does that make you feel? Now, lots of different responses to that, um, which I hear quite regularly from people. Well, people will say, well, I don't know enough about what it means to be a Christian, to be part of this. I can't be part of, of doing anything because, you know, I've got nothing to offer. I don't know what it, what it means to be a Christian. Or I'm not good enough to be part of this. That's quite often the case, isn't it? I can't possibly do something because I'm not a good enough person. Or then we might also say, I haven't got anything that God could use. I don't have any gifts or abilities that God could use. Or also, I struggle with so much, surely it can't be possible for God to use me. These are all things that I hear people say when we start to talk about faith and how God might want to use us all for his purposes. We are going to get on to Moses in a minute, I promise. But let's look for a moment at the illustration of clay. You might um, know that I quite like playing with clay these days. It's one of the things I enjoy. And clay is a funny thing. There's some air-dry clay here, which those of us who played the other week would, would recognise when, we when we did it in um, More Creative. So we get some clay. It looks fairly boring, doesn't it, like that? But if it's boring like that, if you're really good at it, and I have to say I'm not really good at it, I'm not on the Great Pottery Showdown or anything like that, and I don't ever intend to be, but if you're really good at, good at it or you play with it, you don't even have to be really good at it, you can make something from this little bit of clay, something could be created that was really special. It's really boring like that. But actually, if you play with it for a bit and let it dry, manipulate it, you can make something. Well, this is something I, I've made, with, but just a little plaque to put on my side that says, chosen, to remind me that God has chosen me. Or you could make a beautiful vase if you were really good at it. Or a statue. Clay can be changed and transformed. And... Um, in the Bible, there's a lot of talk about God as a potter and us as clay. God wants to change and transform us. But at a very basic level, clay is the product of a chemical reaction between silicite rocks and water. That's the very basic level. That's what clay is. But it can be moulded and changed to something different. It's still made up from the same thing. It doesn't change its basic constitution when it's moulded and changed. It still has the same things about it, but it's been changed and shaped and refined and made beautiful. We're now going to get on to Moses. You'll see the connection, hopefully. Because when we look at Moses, 
Moses was not the best person in the world, was he? But Moses was somebody who was shaped and refined for God's purposes and became a real man of God despite his hard headiness. And God used him in powerful ways. So let's have a bit of a recap about Moses. We started from chapter 2, verse 11. If you read the bit that's on your sheet that was the mistake, um, we see a bit more about Moses. We see that Moses was saved from the Egyptians by the faith of his mother and his sister Miriam, who put him in a basket, and he was found and brought up by the Pharaoh's daughter as his own. So God put him in a privileged position for the plans he had for him. But here we see something of the person that he was. He was grown up in Pharaoh's palace, but he knew he was different. We already see him identifying with his own community, even if it wasn't really part, even if he wasn't really part of that community at that time. And in our story today, we see something of Moses where he doesn't show his best character. And yet we see that God can still use him. It's mightily reassuring that God can use us all for his purpose. He can take the sort of person that we are, with all our traits of character, all the way that we've been created, and transform us and use us for his purpose. Every one of us. So let's have a look um, at Moses, uh, at that passage again. You haven't got it in front of you, unfortunately, but I'll, I'll read, read it again, bits of it again for you. So firstly, he observes his own people. We see him observing his own people. So one day after Moses had grown up, he went out to the people and saw their forced labor. He went out and saw their forced labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his kinsfolk. So even though he'd grown up in the house of Pharaoh, he was a man who identified with his community, who's watching his commun- the community and learning from them. And he recognises their hardship. He notices the hardship that they're under. He saw at first hand what the Egyptians were doing, how hard they were working, the Israelites, how they were being used as slaves. He felt the pain of his people even when he was in the home of Pharaoh and not a slave. Take the example of Moses and look at the person of Jesus and we see something similar in a way. That that Jesus grew up in a home and he learned a skill and a trade and he knew all about the people that he was amongst. He knew the law and was able to challenge it. He had compassion for those on the edge of society He seems to have understood the problems of the day and was able to try to work to change those. What about us? Do we know what's going on around us? Do we observe the patterns of the day? Do we know what some of the problems around us are that we may be called to challenge, that we may be called to in some way bring change. I was really shocked this week, really, really shocked when I was in a meeting this week um, and they were talking about the problem of children not being in school. There is a huge problem in our community of children who are refusing to go to school. Post-COVID, possibly, That that obviously has had a huge impact. But the mental health of our children is so bad that actually of this group of of families, of about 100 families, 10% of them are not in, their children not in school. If we, that is huge, isn't it? Huge, huge issue um, of of, of non-school attendance. What can we do about it? Well, in many ways, we can't do very much about that. But we can let those in authority know that there is a problem and that actually they need to begin to address it. We can tell our councillors that actually they need to invest more in child and, men- child and adolescent mental health services. We can begin to make people know and we can offer support to some of those families, possibly. 
You know, that it, I, I was just amazed. And, we, and there are other things that we need to just be prepared to listen to see what's in, um, going on in our community. So Moses observed his own people. And then, carrying on, not only did his, he observe his people, but he took action, possibly not the right action, but he took action. So in verse 12, he looked this way and that. You can just see him furtively looking back like this, can't you? And uh, seeing that no one was watching, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Not the greatest of actions of a man of God. So he'd noticed what was going on with his people and he wasn't going to stand by and see this injustice and not do anything about it. But he didn't just challenge it, he challenged it with his own violence. And then he hid, in his cunning, he hid the body from others, trying to get away with what he'd done wrong, hoping others won't notice. Isn't that such a reflection on us all? We sometimes try to get away with things, hoping nobody else will notice. So he he was so nearly right, wasn't he? He was so nearly got it right. He noticed injustice, but he acted in the wrong way to put it right. Here we see the violence, the cunning, the cunning of Moses, the traits of a character that aren't at all attractive. Surely God can't use a man like this, or can he? Well, we know he did if we read on in the story, and we shall see over the next few weeks how God did use Moses mightily. If we looked at Jesus, we see a different reaction. He challenged injustice too, but it didn't lead to him being violent. He actually took the violence upon himself. And then Moses sees the reality of the situation when he's confronted by um, his fellow Hebrews. When he went out the next day, he saw two Hebrews fighting. And he said to the one who was in the wrong, why do you strike your fellow Hebrew? He answered, who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then was, Moses was afraid and thought, surely this thing is known. And when Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. So here we see Moses being caught out when he's trying to challenge wrongdoing in his community. And he realized that his own people weren't perfect. And he's frightened by what might happen to him and he rephrased his rejection in two ways two ways from the community that he isn't part of but he should be part of the Israelites and now Pharaoh's after him too so he's forced to run and he flees he flees to Midian as a foreigner and here his circumstances turn around again as he finds favor with the house of Raul Raul is that the right way to say it it's all right, okay. When he helps his daughters. So Moses... I didn't know you Yeah, over, okay. You did it so well, Lydia. So, so, so Moses has been rejected by all he knew, and he fled to a new life. He starts afresh and is now in a place of relative safety, whilst his people still in, live in slavery in Egypt. We're told that this isn't the end of the story, towards the end of the chapter, when we're told that God looked upon the Israelites and God took notice of them. God hadn't forgotten them. God was concerned about them. And here Moses, the man who'd grown up in the Egyptian court, is now safe and might be in a good place to go back (coughs) and talk to the new king at the right time, as we shall see in the next few weeks. God's plans aren't on hold His plans are still in progress, and we know that God will use Moses to bring them about. Moses, the man who knew and recognized his own. Moses, the man who'd known fear and rejection. Moses, the hot-headed who'd lashed out when he saw violence and ended up committing murder. God had created Moses. He'd been created with his wonderful traits where he was able to notice and respond to injustice but he got things wrong. To all extents and purposes, he should have been in prison for taking another life. He got so, things so very young, wrong. And yet God was still able to use this mixed up person for his purposes. 
In the same way, God created us, each and every one of us. He made us as we are. He gave us our gifts of encouragement, of listening, of noticing, of caring, of being able to turn up with a cup of tea when necessary, and so many more gifts. But he also knows that we are all capable of getting things wrong. But like Moses, we need to be moulded to turn the things we get wrong into something beautiful. So how are you going to be used? Can we all be open to allow God to mould us into something beautiful? We need to pray for the Holy Spirit to use our inborn born traits for his purpose. To transform the bits of us that need changing so that we can be used effectively for his purpose. Because as I started with 1 Corinthians 12, each of us has a part to play in his body here to bring in his vision for this church and this community. Are you willing to be open, to be changed and moulded and used for his purposes? If God can use Moses, he can use any one of us. Going to, I've asked John to sing something which, as I was reflecting on what I was going to say to you this morning, it was a song that came into my head and um, I'd like to share it as we think and pray on what I've said. Jesus, you are changing. Thank you, Lucy, John. Let's stand together and affirm our faith in the God in whom we can trust and the one who, the only one in whom we can rely to change and transform us. We say together, Christ is the image of the invisible God. Thrones, powers, rulers, authorities, All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead. Amen. Let us pray, sit or kneel. Thank you, Roger. Let us pray.
There is a hymn which we sometimes sing that says, Father, I place into your hands the things I cannot do. And it goes on to say, For I know I always can trust you. And Lord, today we come with our prayers knowing that we can always trust you. Today, there are over 28 wars worldwide. But there are, and there are these and many concerns that we cannot influence apart from praying. But there are three of these wars which we see regularly on our screens and on our radio. So can we bring them to you, dear Lord? Firstly, there's the terrible uncalled for war in Ukraine and the recent flooding caused by the major dam being breached. Secondly, the devastating war that's going on in Sudan. The effects are impacting our linked diocese of Wau in South Sudan with refugees and putting extra pressure on very limited resources. And thirdly, there's a continuing tribal war in Yemen, which seems to be absolutely endless. And Father, we are aware that many Christians are persecuted and imprisoned for their faith and for standing up for what is right. We think particularly of those in Russia who stand up against the war in Ukraine. And may their voices never be silenced. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Then there are famines in numerous areas exacerbated by climate change. Father, we as individuals are powerless, but you are in charge, and we pray today for your intervention. We pray for all families that have had their businesses, homes, and lives destroyed by war for all those who have lost loved ones, for those on the verge of starvation due to crop failures, due to sea level rise, or other natural disasters, such as those recent earthquakes in uh, Syria and Turkey. Again, in the quiet of our own hearts, please bring these issues to God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, many families are struggling financially. We pray for those helping them, and we thank you for the various food banks, pantries, and charities that are helping in different ways. We pray that Christian organizations remain at the heart of our communities and pray that non-churchgoers would ask the question, why are Christians doing this? And may we not be totally silent on that. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear Lord, we learn from reading, for the reading in uh, Exodus, just how merciful you are and how you will give each of us, like Moses, a second chance to fulfill our potential. So we pray that you would show us what we can do as individuals and as a church fellowship to spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, in the words of the, that hymn, Father, I want to be with you and do the things you do. Father, I want to speak the words that you are speaking to. Lord, we acknowledge we are often too timid to share our faith. We pray that you would give us the courage to speak out about our beliefs to others when we have an opportunity. Please challenge us and remind us that we are never too old to serve. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
This weekend, the Archbishop of Canterbury is visiting the Salisbury Diocese and has addressed many young people at SML at the Resound event. Lord, we pray that his talk will confirm and encourage the next generation to believe in the truth of the gospel. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us, in the last section of our prayers, pray for ourselves, our families, and friends. And returning to the theme of that hymn that I mentioned earlier, Father, we place into your hands our friends and family. Father, we place into your hands the things that trouble us. For we know we always can trust you. We end our prayers by saying together, Merciful Father, accept our prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. reminds us that we pray for God's kingdom to come. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And as we've been reminded, we are the body of Christ. In the one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. So then let us pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. A brief moment just to share the peace with one another. And we shall stand to sing the hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be.
The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, it is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. For he is your living word, through him you have created all things from the beginning and formed us in your own image. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name for ever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Do please be seated if you wish. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood. Who, in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, we remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of your kingdom. And with this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Lord. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Accept through him our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours forever and ever. Amen. We shall administer communion in the usual way, just to the music group first here and then to the uh, chancel steps. Please do come forward and to receive bread and wine or just the bread or and keep your hands to your side if you just wish to receive a blessing. We welcome all who love the Lord to gather around the table. So let's pray this prayer together as we come. Be present, Lord Jesus Christ. Make yourself known in the breaking of bread. As we are fed with the bread of heaven, may we know your resurrection power. Through Christ, our risen Lord. Amen.
Shall we say this final prayer together, this prayer of thanksgiving. Eternal Father, we thank you for nourishing us with these heavenly gifts. May our communion strengthen us in faith, build us up in hope, and make us grow in love for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So we stand together to sing our final hymn before the throne of God above. Thank mm-hmm. you. So whenever you hear that voice which says that you're not worthy or you're not good enough, remember the words of that hymn and what we've been sharing together this morning. It's through God's grace and it's in him that we find the strength and the transforming power of God to make us those people that God wants us to be. So may God the Holy Trinity make you strong in faith and love, defend you on every side and guide you in truth and peace.
and the blessing of God Almighty, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Amen. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. with uh, um, where's she gone? Agnes, have a word with Agnes if you want to put your names forward for the uh, um, for the barbecue uh, family get together on July the 9th and um, my wife's just reminded me <laughs> that, that, that at St George's Oakdale I think at half past seven on Wednesday evening it's the swearing in of church wardens so she'd be very happy if anybody wanted to go with her to uh, go along for that. It's, it's really for PCCs and uh, church wardens. So if you would like to go, you're very welcome. Thank you. And thank you one and all for all you've done. Thank you, John, <laughs> wherever you've gone. Oh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs>